I'm still in Philippians 3, and you know it. I'll not uh, grind it out again by reading it once more. In 7 to 15, it's Philippians 3, beginning with, But those things which were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. As for me to know, you said, Be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of God through faith, the darkness. If by any means I might attain, and not as though I had already had attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, and I forget the things that are behind, and I press forward, and let us therefore as many be perfect be thus much. Now, this man, this most aggressive man, this boldest man, this sure-footed man, and the saintliest man. And if you think I'm overstating it, let me read to you some things he said tonight. The Holy Ghost witnesses that in every city bonds and afflictions awaken, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life here unto myself, so that I might finish my course in my ministry. First Corinthians. He said rather partly, Though well, you have ten thousand instructors in Christ, you have one father. You have not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore be followers of me. In First Corinthians again, sixth chapter, he said, I, I have judged already what to do concerning this man who has done this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, with the power of the Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one that's taken for the destruction of the flesh. The Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Galatians, he said, Henceforth let no man trouble me. Let me alone. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Now those are only five texts. You'll find them all through Acts and the Epistle. There was a sure footedness about the man. Under this crawling on his stomach, this man knew. What did he mean? He knew where he stood. He knew God. He knew the confidence with the great cosmic confidence. But that same man was yet the most self-distrustful man. Listen to this. Late first instance. For I am the least to be a apostle, and am not meant to be called an apostle. It's only by the grace of God that I am what I am. Second instance. We have this stranger in earth and vessel, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. First Timothy. This is a faithful thing and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of which I am chief. Rome. For I know that in me is in my natural flesh, in my body, in my in my natural nature, my old Paul, Paul, for I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. Now, I haven't exhausted these texts. I've only given you uh, four, five, two texts on each side. And therefore, we may properly conclude that Paul's great personal triumph from his side resulted from an entire and radical distrust of himself. And that's what I'm going to preach on tonight. Self-distrust as the last great obstacle, or self-trust, as the last great obstacle to spiritual triumph. And uh, this man, Paul, didn't trust himself. Before man, he was bold as a lion. Before God, he couldn't say too much against himself. He had no confidence in himself at all. And the, the, the confidence of the man in God was in inverse proportion to his confidence in himself. As far as he trusted himself, he did not trust God. As far as he distrusted himself, he was thrown out upon God. Now, self-trust, respectability, and self-assurance which comes by education, birth, what you hear about yourself, and what do your friends tell you about yourself, and uh, all the 
choice you make of yourself, self-trust is the last great obstacle to go out of the light. That shall explain after the tape is born, still is gone. And that is why we wade around the deep river of God as animals around the water hole, afraid to go in. We never do quite get in. There was an old man that I want to quote a little tonight, not boringly. He had a wonderful name, I think, Lorenzo Spatoli. I think that's a wonderful name. Well, Lorenzo Spatoli was one of those strange Protestants who during his lifetime, her about a running fight, more or less, and was considered more or less a heretic because of his evangelical view of the way back uh, three, four hundred years. And uh, this man said this, distrust of yourself is so necessary to you in this combat that without it, you must hold it certain. What I liked about the such men as this, and Paul and others, is the clear, sharp, clean language they use, and without any, as it were, stuff, without any of that, uh, that just was as it were, and uh, so to speak, and uh, possibly, none of that. He said, distrust of yourself is so necessary to you in this spiritual combat, that without it, you must hold it certain that you will not be able to obtain the desired victory. This trust is self. Then he said, we are much too easily inclined by our corrupt nature to a false opinion of ourselves. Without any foundation at all, we presume vainly in our own now this, he continues, is a defect very difficult to understand and most displeasing in the eyes of God who loves us and desires in us a loyal recognition of every grace and every virtue proceeds from him alone who is the fountain of all good and that nothing, not even a good thought, can come from us except it be of his will. Now you can be converted, born again, and go up around and take the phone for a hundred years and never find this out. Now most of us haven't been around a hundred years, but you haven't found this out yet. You haven't found out what prayer I found, and what we did we quote, but never answer that. That this obstacle to spiritual victory is self trust. And the after sin has been put away. Every sin that we know has been put away in our search for God. And after all the self sins that we know about have been crucified, we stop boasting, we stop loving ourselves with him, and we put away the hyphenated self sins all we can, and think we put it all down. We reckoned ourselves and things to be dead had died uh, on the sin through Jesus Christ. After we've humbled ourselves, even publicly, the good of the mountain, after we've humbled ourselves, then self-trust may be stronger than it was before. Because you see, it has no foundation to build on. So after we have put away our sins, and after we have given up our well, and after we have taken a full position and allowed ourselves to be shoved around, and after we have been nerves and have been rubbed in the dust, then self-trust is still in harm to me. And a lot of people mis uh, take that consolation of self-whispering there for the Holy Ghost. And that's why we're so weak when we think we're strong. And self-consolation or self-trust is like this. Say, now, you're far in advance of others. You people are always having it wrong in the world. You're far in advance. But then you put things behind you. And uh, you confess and humble yourself. Now, you may trust yourself, of course, with God's help. And you may 
expect the victory to come and power. Do it your time. You're not one of these dead ones. You're, you're one of these uh, these live ones, self tells you. And it's cost you a lot, hasn't it, brother, self tells you. And uh, you, you had to part with friends in order to push on, hasn't you, self tells you, and rubbed your back nicely downward and, uh, and you enjoy it so much. So uh, you put things behind you, haven't you? Yes. And uh, you humble yourself. Now you may trust yourself. You're you're up there. You're getting somewhere. Of course, you understand. It's got to be God's help. But uh, you may expect victory now. Now that's self-trust, brethren. And almost all the joy the average Christian has is the back scratching of self -trust. That's all the pleasure he gets is the back scratching that he gets from self. Take a cat and scratch it between the ears, and it'll close its eyes and we call hunker down. That is, uh, back in Pennsylvania, that brother knows what hunkering down means. Hunkering, just, you know, crouching. Uh, I think that's an old Scotch word. And uh, quite familiar to me in my boyhood. Well, the cat will do that because they, they love to, to be scratched. The cow will come put her head over the fence and scratch it between the ears and and uh, pet her, and she'll love and stand there. Well, now, self is always scratching the ears of the people of God. And the further they go on into the will of God, and the deeper they go, the more back scratching they get, the more ear scratching. And self says, well, certainly you know better. You've read Thomas the Tempest, and uh, you, you, you're different. You love the old hymn. And you none of this junk for you. And uh, you're a separated Christian. None of these movies for you. None of this crazy modern stuff for you. You're you're better. And you don't know that uh, what's happening to you. You're you're, you're feeling good. And uh, you're feeling good is strictly you're being scratched by a self that hasn't yet died. There the trust is there. After you think he's gone. Now, why is self-trust so wrong? Self-trust is so wrong because it robs God to give to man. God said, ye have robbed me, and ye say, wherein have we robbed? Well, that was under in another context. But we rob God, and we take away from God the, the, uh, this thing that the brother wrote about, uh, that he is the God is the fountain of all good, and that nothing, not even a good thought can come from us except it comes from God. We take that away from God, and we give it to our converted and sanctified self. And it's just as bad, just as bad as uh, it can be, because it takes away from God the ultimate, the final trust. It misjudges God in man, and holds God to be less than he is, and man to be more than he is. And this is mainly the trouble with it. We think God's less than he is, and man is more than he is. And we can go to school and study theology and learn how God is the source and fountain and all the rest, and learn about the attributes, and still in our heart, still believe God is less than he is, and we're more than we are. And uh, thus, it's like, it's like the moon. I suppose the moon could talk and think and have a personality. And the moon should uh, begin to say, well, I shine. I shine on the earth. And uh, I, uh, every time that I am around where I can reach the earth, uh, I see the earth becomes beautiful. And somebody would come and say, well, listen, don't you know that by yourself you are burnt ash? Don't you know that uh, you've been discovered and found out? You don't shine at all. You reflect. It's the sun that shines. And I could see self telling the moon, well, uh, you're letting your light shine. It. You're doing a good job. I notice when you're not up, the whole side of the earth lies in darkness. But when you come, it lightens up, and you begin to see the roofs of houses, and you do a fine job. And uh, the moon would nod and say, well, 
in the glory that belongs to God, in the, by the grace of God, I'm like this, but all the time, the moon thinks it's shining. When the moon isn't shining at all, it's reflecting. And St. Paul could boldly shine and talk about it because he knew that he wasn't shining at all. He knew that he didn't have a thing that was fit for heaven. It was the grace of God in him, and it was God and not he. He completely and radically did trust in himself. Now, no man ever really knows about himself. He doesn't know how we feel. Just as no man really knows what he sounds like. Everybody thinks he, thinks he sounds right till he hears himself on stage. One of the most humbling things ever happened to me happened about ten years ago when uh, I had my first uh, sermon preached on the record. After I heard that, I never could stand the sound of my own voice. Well, that, that thing didn't lie to me, and I heard myself on stage dozens of times trying to work something out that I could use, uh, but it always sounds terrible. But up to that time, I have been told that I had a fine teaching voice, people coming, good voice. But I heard it. Right? Nobody needs any more to talk to. I heard it. I, I listened to it. I've been forced to hear it. But no man knows the sound of his own voice till he hears it. And no man knows how weak he is till God's exposed it. And nobody wants to be exposed. But God has to expose. And what we consider our strength is our weakness. If you will think over your life reverently and carefully in prayer, and put down on the pad the things you think are your virtues, those are your weakness. And those very virtues are your sources of trouble. And the only way you can deal with yourself is look away and look under him, as I've been telling you. You stop thinking about yourself at all. Now, nobody can know how weak he is, and nobody can know how bad he is until he's been exposed by the Holy Ghost, and nobody wants to be exposed. And nobody knows how unstable he is. You remember that fellow in the Old Testament that said, Is thy servant a dog that I would do a thing like that? Apparently meant it, went straight home and did it. The prophet said, you're going to murder your man. He said, his eyes servant are his dog. The prophet didn't reply. He went home and put a pillow over his master's face and smothered him to death. You remember a certain great old bold fisherman who stood up and said, let everybody else run from you, Lord, I'll not. The Lord said, before the cock crows twice, you will. And he did. And you will find that nobody knows how unstable he is. And that's why it's dangerous to trust our good habits. That's why it's dangerous to trust our virtue, because we're unstable. Now, how, how then do we learn self-distrust? Well, this distrust is indeed the work of God's hand, says the man. And he's accustomed to give it to his dear friends in four ways. So I want to tell you. This takes the high door, but here are the four ways that God teaches this trust. There may be some others, but these four are valid ways. He says, uh, uh, he says, it's the work of God's hand, this distrust. Now, I can't preach it on to you. That's too bad. I saw a cartoon once of a fellow with a hole on the top of his head and a funnel, and somebody was throwing it in. And I've always had a kind of a goofy longing that I could do that with congregation. Just, just, just uh, trip hand them, don't they call that? Put a funnel in and pour it in, but you can't get it that way. All any preacher can do, and I don't care who he is. All can do is preach to the land of God being on you. And if you don't make it, it's not the preacher's fault necessarily. If he hasn't been quite honest enough, hasn't been quite severe enough, hasn't been quite a, quite powerful enough, maybe, but at least if he's done that one thing, that's all. Now there are four things, says the dear old man of God, and what he says is, is supported and uh, confirmed by uh, almost all of the devotional writers and the great hymnists and biographers or persons about whom geographies were written. 
He says, sometimes it comes by holy inspiration. Now, that would be the best way to get it. The best way to find out you're no good is to have God flash a holy inspiration into your soul and just let you know something. I think that's happened to some people. Uh, I think it has. Brother Lawrence, you know. Uh, Herman. Nicholas Herman, Brother Lawrence. Said it happened to him. And he said for 40 years he never was out of the presence of God once. Never out of the conscious presence of God. And he said when I took the cross, and decided to obey Jesus and walk this holy way. He said, uh, from reading around and hearing, I gather that I have to suffer a lot. But he said, for some reason, God never comes in word of much suffering. He just, uh, he just let me uh, continue to trust him. He said, I put all my self-trust away, and I'm trusting in God completely. Paraphrasing it, carrying his cross, he said, and believing that he's in me and around me and near me and praying all the time. And he said uh, he's never given me very much suffering to do. And uh, I have uh, told you, it's excited quite a little bit of attention around the, over this country, about little old Julian. Uh, the Ju Julian, the Lady Julian. And they're searching for her books and all the rest now. Well, she only wrote one, and outside of that one experience she had, when she got her three wounds, she never had to do much suffering after that. God gave by a holy inspiration light to her heart, and she knew instantly she was no good, and Jesus Christ was everything, and she stayed right there until she died, growing every day. Well, that'd be the easiest way to get it would be for the Lord to come and just by a sweet, sudden, holy inspiration within our hearts and the scriptures tell us how bad we are. But you say, Mr. Closer, I already know I'm bad. I'm a believer. I'm totally bad. You can be a confirmed believer in total depravity and be as proud as Russia and trust yourself so as to shut out the face of God and present victory. Theologically, total depravity hasn't got a, hasn't, isn't what you need here at all. I happen to be one of those who believes, according to the scriptures, that man is a sinner by, what is it, birth, and an alien by birth, and a sinner by choice. I believe that. I never believed anything yet. I, I never have any trouble with theology. Some people are always writing me in difficulties with theology. Either I don't have sense enough or the dear God preserves me, because I never have any worry about total depravity and all that and how I can inherit the evil from my father. I, I don't know a thing about it. All I know is that as soon as I was big enough to sin, I went into the business. And I know that every child I've ever known or seen did the same thing. No matter who you are, I said to the boys upstairs, uh, I said, you know, every race and every nationality has its vice, doesn't it? Everybody, and he said, yes, all but the Irish, Max. But every nationality, every one has his own vice. But uh, it's the vice that stands out. Beetle nuts to one place and did something else and another. They all have one vice. What's the reason? At least one. God knows there may be a thousand, but at least outstanding, because we're all alike. We're born bad. And uh, we can believe that and accept it and teach it boldly to others. And those who most trust themselves may yet be the ones who are most often quoted, quoting all our righteous messages are but filthy rags, careful to put the S on the end and confirm the fact that it's not singular but plural. Our righteous messes are filthy rags. Now, you see, it takes, it takes the Holy Ghost to tell you you're bad and make you, make you see it. It takes the Holy Ghost to tell you you're weak and make you see it. Uh, the key tells you you're weak and you can go through and get a degree that long. You come out and still go proudly out to be a preacher or proudly out to be a missionary or a Bible teacher or whatever. He says God is, is wants 
Wendy's friend with Kelly Joy Green, Christian South Beach Trust. Sometimes we're holding in place. Four seconds. Sometimes we're cross church. That's more where I come from. Sometimes with harsh courage. I don't know who we could use for a better illustration than the man Job. We pity Job so with human, human sympathy, and we sort of have to take Job's part against God if we don't watch ourselves. And we certainly take Job's part against his wife. Only good thing I know about all that was that she never heard of it again. I don't know what happened to her, but she got out of the picture. But uh, have you noticed that this man, Job, was a long way from being a humble man? You ever notice it? He was a praying man. And he was a man who made sacrifices, lest his children had sinned the night before at their party. Couldn't be for any time. The first job on the scene was great, or he did. But uh, listen to him now, along toward the, the latter third of his long talk, he said, Moreover, Job continued, he's terrible. And I know better your book than terrible. You see here what it says in the margin. As I was in the days of my youth, and the secret of God was upon my cabinet. When the Almighty was yet with me, and when my children were about me, when I washed my steps with butter and the rock poured me out rivers of oil, when I went out to the gate to the city, and when I prepared my seat in the street. He was the big shop, you know. That's what they did then. This didn't have a city hall, they had a place at the head of the street, and there the big shop sat. When the young men saw me, he said, they hid themselves, and the aged rose and stood up. Who was this coming down the street? Honorable Mr. Cruz. Oh, he said, here I am lying, now in this ash pile, a miserable wreck. They cast me out, nobody'd vote for me. He said the day was when I went down the street, the young people hid themselves, the old people stood up. And princes were framed talking and laid their hands on their mouths. You think Brother Job was an ordinary rag picker? Brother Job was a great man. And he knew it, and that was the trouble. And that's why he had to have all that happen to him. If you're great and don't know it, nothing will happen to you. But if you happen to suspect it and you love God, things will start to happen to you. And if they don't, it's because you're not far enough along to the Lord to trust you. That the nobles held their peace and their tongues cleaved to the roof of their mouth. And when the ear heard me, blessed me so. And I delivered the poor when they cried to me. The blessing of the poor was upon my head. That was Job. He was just telling them the kind of fellow he used to be. And the awful part about this is this was a half crack. It was a half crack. And he had been for I don't know how long sitting on an ash pile with his enemy all around him. But he got the God went on until I was sick. And the scourging began to bite into the soul of the man. And then we're not going to it, but you know how that time came when he said, Oh God, I've been talking and talking and talking, but now I'll shut up. I put my hand over my mouth. I am vile, oh God. And when he got that lesson, then the Lord said, All right, go now. Pray for your for the rest of them. So he prayed for the rest of them. And God gave him back twice more. Well, harsh virgins. You know, I sound as if I belong to 17th century. Nobody talks like this anymore. You don't hear anybody talk about it. That's why everybody has to ring the cowbell to get a little bit of pleasure. That's why they have to bring in talking horse in order to have any fun. Say, John 3.16, bring in the horse. And they all quote John 3.16 and then have the horse paw the ground. 
to show how many apostles there were, 12 times from the apostle. That's why, because nobody wants to hear anything about our dear Heavenly Father do you want to teach his children self-trust by distrust by harsh spirit. Now some of you will say that man told you the hard man. You like to lay on the ladder. You know what? If I could, I'd preach on the 23rd Psalm every day for a year. Every Sunday for a year. Then after I was through the 23rd Psalm, I'd take up the 53rd of Isaiah. Then when I was through that, I'd preach on 1 Corinthians 13. But if I did that, you know where you'd be in the meantime? You'd be the spongiest, softest, sweetest bunch of no good in the God ever got together. God has to have, give us harsh scourging sometimes. It'd be like feeding your family nothing but sugar cookies. You know what had happened to them? They'd lose their teeth when they're 12 years old. There has to be some solid stuff. The harsh spiritual. We talk about it briefly and pass it by. Nobody puts any emphasis there. And then the third, the third way is sometimes with violent and insuperable temptation. Violent and insuperable temptation. When we're violently tempted and for a moment insuperably tempted, we're inclined to throw in the white towel and say, God is no use. No use, I'm no good. I read about Moody and Augustine and all the rest, but no use, God, you don't want me, I'm finished. Forgetting that God is wont to teach his friends self-distrust sometimes by violent and insuperable temptation. And sometimes when something blows up on you that you thought was dead and buried years ago, instead of your taking it as a proof that you're not a Christian child, you ought to take it as a proof that you're nearer home today than you were yesterday. And that your heavenly Father is letting this thing happen to you to show you you're no good. Now, um, we got back to Brother Lawrence again. He said that he walked with the Lord all the time. But he said, if ever I make a slip anywhere, he said, I never let it give me much trouble. I go straight to the Lord and I say, now, Lord, that me. And if you don't help me, that's what you can expect. For that's me. And he said, God forgave me, and I went right on to me. Not much trouble. Uh, we, uh, we are told sometimes by men who are trying to help us, and they are trying to help us, that repentance is a long, drawn-out uh, affair where we have to beat ourselves a long time. And I, I believe in that kind of repentance, too. But there comes a time when uh, we realize that the best way to handle anything, as Fenelon said, the best repentance is turn toward God and don't do it anymore. That's the best repentance in the right world. If you did something last week that you're ashamed of and sit here under conviction and condemnation about, you say, how can I repent? The best repentance is to turn to the Lord, tell him, and then don't do it anymore. That's the best repentance in the wide world. And uh, these temptations that let you fall down from time. What are they for? Are they proof that you're not a true Christian at all? No. They're proof that your conscience is tender, you're very near to God, and that the Lord is trying to teach you that last lesson of self-distrust by a violent temptation. You remember Jacob's temptation, don't you? And you remember Peter's. And all down the years, we get illustrate. In the end years of fourth, we are Heavenly Father who wants to teach us self this uh, by other means not understood by us. By other means not understood by us. You know, we're all born theologians. 
And when anything happens, we'll always like to run to the scripture and be able to quote it and say, now that's according to this verse right here, isn't it, brother? Yes. What does that say in the margin? We've got it. And we have a certain confidence in ourselves. We know just exactly what's going on. This wise old saint of God said, Sometimes God teaches you self-distrust by in what method you don't know what's happening to you. Have you ever been in that fix? If you haven't, and I've preached this in the ninth sermon on this text, and if, if, you, if this hasn't happened to you over the last week, I ought to be in Florida. Because I'm doing no good here. But if you, uh, if you don't know, if you don't know, you would say, well, God won't even show me what's taking place. Well, he knows you're still here. And he knows that you're so proud of the way you rightly divide the word of truth. And that you can just disjoint the text just like a butcher getting your chicken ready for you. And the word lies all out there carefully laid out, and you know, just where to put your finger on this, and just where to put it on this. You're too smart for God to bless you, bro. You know too much. <laughs> and you can identify everything. And the dear Heavenly Father knows that you don't know much after all. And so he lets things happen to you that you don't know what's happening to you. And uh, your friends don't know. And when you go to somebody you trust and you feel that, oh, that man's a saint, he'll be able to tell you he looks blank and he can't tell you either. And that's good. That's wonderful. It'd be terrible if we had some holy St. Francis who everybody could go to and find out where they were and all about it. Well, God loves you too much and he's trying to teach you to trust him and not people, not lean on people. I have been so scared that people would start trusting in me, leaning on me. God picks the, the, the crutches out from under me every once in a while. Just pick me from the people who trust me. Now, these means that God uses, you don't know what they are. And you can't locate yourself. But you're, you're a Christian, you know it, and you love God, and you're sick of all the nonsense in the world, and you're sick of all the nonsense in the church. And uh, your heart's crying after God as a roll after the water books. And your heart and your flesh cry out for God, even the living God. And uh, yet here's this obstacle. You still trust yourself. You're born again. You can say that and testify to it. You love your Bible. You have your prayer. You're a good Christian. But you still trust yourself. And uh, it made it harder for you to get rid of it because nobody talks about it anymore. Only a half a dozen of us. Less than fundamental circles, I guess. They never say anything about it, at least around this area. And if you're a Christian at all, everybody scratches back your neck and says, Glory to God, brother, you're born again. But the Lord says that's only the beginning. This baby in your bed said, just to say, turn off here tonight and say, I'm a little reminder. But this baby that uh, was dedicated three months old, born in Germany. And I saw the father, Captain Fitz. And uh, I said, Hello, Captain. Nice to see you again. We had a nice. Uh, and shaking time, and, uh, and uh, this, 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 this good fellow said about his baby. I said, "How's the baby?" The old lady says, "He's not much of a baby anymore, brother." So he said, "No." He says, "Oh." He wasn't kidding. He meant that. He said, "He's a new father, you know, and only one is happy." Three months old, so he's a big boy. Well, sir, uh, now that's that's so natural and normal that they watch every new thing he does, and the first thing he turns to, and everything. And our heavenly Father loves his people like that, and he loves you like that. And don't let anybody frighten you. Don't let anybody come along with wild stories. Right. I'll always show you.
made his bones a wild story. If it was true that everybody that ought to be killed, God killed him, you'd have a different preacher here tonight. If it was true that every time a Christian rebelled, God took his babies, he'd lost all seven of ours. If it was true that every time we fail and miss the will of God and blunder out and do something wrong, the Lord puts us on this shelf. I'd have been a piece of statuary by this time. I just don't let them tell me those things. I know that. I know God, and God isn't that kind of God. He isn't that kind of God. He only judges when there's nothing else to do. When a lifetime of rebellion and hard and belief and sin loving and violent refusal bring judgment and judgment falls. But the scripture says it's God's strange work. God doesn't like to do it. And when God is sending or allowing violent and insuperable temptations and harsh scourgings and strange means that you can't identify, he's not judging. He's watching you go. And if I could look at the word about God, he's proud to see you go. Zephaniah says that he will rejoice over us with joy and he will joy over us with sin. And if that isn't a picture of a father singing over his family, I don't know what is. And back in the, one of the late chapters in Deuteronomy, it says that, uh, that the beloved of the Lord dwells between his shoulders. And as a lad, I carried my baby brother that way. Take it back, he said. God picks us up and carries us, makes all our bed in our sickness, and understandeth our thoughts and knows we're dust and and uh, he's loving and patient toward us and uh, so God isn't judging God isn't angry God is just wanting his children to grow and he has some time to give them some harsh scourges well now what are we to do well we're the trusting and loving and absolutely count on you know anybody who can count on completely? You can count on You know anybody who can count on You say to yourself, well, let me see. Would Brother so-and-so suppose so I could count on me? Well, you know anybody you could count on if you were wrong? We wouldn't all count on our friends if we were right. But suppose we went wrong. You know anybody you can count on? Great old French preacher once said, my friends would fill the great cathedral. But my real friend could occupy these things too. Well, it wasn't a thing, it was a real. You know anybody you can count on when you're not right? Well, I can tell you somebody. His name is Jesus. And God hath made this same Jesus Lord in Christ. So what you're to do is trust him from people and let him work. And don't push it. Don't struggle. Don't beat the bench and say, God, you got to do it now. If you're in the hands of God and obeying God, God's leading you. And know absolutely that God will never let you down. He'll never, never let you down. And then, third thing I say in closing is look around for footprints where you are. You don't know where you are. God is, is trying to teach yourself this trust in one of the hardest things. That, uh, as long as you, you know what you're standing on, they tell me that an earthquake is one of the most shocking, excuse me, it's no pun intended. One of the most shocking things. If it's a flood, you see it coming. If it's a cyclone, you see it coming. If it's lightning, you hear the rumble. But when a, an earthquake begins, they say that you lose confidence in your equilibrium. And you lose confidence in kind old Mother Earth that's been solid, 
Long as you can remember, she was solid. And when you put your foot down on it, she never fell. Then one day, she suddenly goes to this place, and Norman almost lose your mind. Then it's a shock and strike when you're suddenly confronted with mistrust in the earth itself. Well, self-confidence is like that. You gingerly put your foot down on your virtues and on your reputation and on what you are. And then when God sends a little earthquake and upsets and, and cracks up and breaks up and even that old confidence you had in yourself begins to go, it's a terrible thing, right? But uh, remember this, that you're not alone in that battle. Look around for footprints, and whose footprints you will see? You'll see here, and you'll see the footprints of all the great sinners, whatever has lived down in here. Oh, but out in Hollywood, they say they have a place, kind of a ungodly upside down Westminster Abbey, where they immortalize some of those prize bulls in concrete. Some great, uh, some great uh, actors, great names, that put his foot in concrete and they let it harden, keep it for posterity. Jeffers, blows in the horn, what will happen to that foot? Well, I'm not interested in that kind of footprint. They're aimed in the wrong direction. They're aimed back the way I came. And I ain't, I ain't going back there. Well, I'm not interested. I'm not even interested in the bus I want. I'm not interested in any of these modern footprints. But uh, you look around, you'll find footprints all aimed in the same direction, toward the feet. And you'll find the footprints of Jesus and the footprints of the king. And there they are, all in the same direction. If you look carefully, you see some of them are kind of backtracking a little occasionally. But they find their way at last and go on. Now, be absolutely cheerful and confident and expectant. We want the Lord to do something for us, don't we? We want him to come down on us with a wave of grace and power. We want him to come to us individually if we're not worthy of it as a congregation. We want to see a reformation, a revival, a downcoming of power. We want to see that. And we're not going to try to work it up. So don't just count me out. The brother said, exclude me out of that. Or include me out of it. I don't intend to try to work up anything. You'll never climb gates of black by sweat and perspiration and hard work. Look not back, look forward, look on him, and stop looking on yourself. And if the ground shaking under you, don't think it's a proof you're no good. That is, if you're not getting anywhere, just think it's a proof that God's showing you how worthless you are. But how dear you are to him. Once I wrote something, a sentence that I wondered whether I should have written. But God knew what I meant when I said, and repeat it to you tonight, that the only eccentricity that I can discover in the heart of God is that a godlike being should love sinners such as we are. Even God has that same eccentricity. Why does God love us? A mother may love a boy that he prayed her and sinned and now on his way to life in prison. That seems to be natural. But there's nothing natural about this love of God. It's a divine thing. It's not pulled out, it's forced out by the inward pressure in the heart of God. So God loves you, and he wants to take you on. And uh, he will teach you if you let him, and he will the rules, and he'll let some harsh scourgings come. And he may even let you trip. If that's heresy, 
All right, fine. And then he wants to be heretical with that. And then that's the trick. Not that he wants to do wrong, but the only way he can show you that without him, you be doing wrong all the time. And so instead of that thing that happened last week, that just so ashamed of, instead of that letting get him, letting you, instead of that getting you down, instead of you letting it get you down, you ought to recognize it as your father. He wants to teach his people self-distrust by violating the people of this country. Sometimes. That's one of his four ways. But I think for some, maybe he has to meet all three mentioned before. A dear God is in my wonder. You know something? I rarely know where I'm going. But after I've been there a year, I can look back and see the path that's been relatively straight. You know, they told about a bird in other days, a funny little bird that said that it flew backwards because it didn't care where it was going, but it's curious to know where it was going. And if you excuse it, uh, that didn't 